The mountain man era in the North American Rocky Mountains lasted from about 1810 until the 1880s, with the era really cresting in the early 1840s. During this period, trappers fanned out through the Intermountain West with the aim of collecting as many beaver pelts as they possibly could. As trappers were mobile, their camps were simple affairs, and rarely, if ever, did they involve anything close to what we would regard today as architecture. Shelter was generally a tent made of blankets or buffalo hides or canvas. Teepees were not widely used by trappers because of their bulk, although trappers did use teepees occasionally during the colder winter months. The painting featured by Alfred Jacob Miller, who once attended a rendezvous of trappers and traders along the Green River in Southwest Wyoming, captures the only eyewitness visual record of the early mountain man chapter of Western American history. As you see in this painting, the trappers have no shelter whatsoever, but rather they sleep directly under the stars. As demand for pelts and other products the trappers provided receded, Many trappers left the Intermountain West and found other employment and lived other lives. A handful, however, stayed on in the region and established forts and outposts that facilitated westward pioneer migration. Architecturally speaking, these outposts were simple structures, but they did play an instrumental role in westward settlement. In terms of Utah history, Fort Bridger is perhaps the most important of the mountain man forts. James or Jim Bridger and his one-time business partner, Louis Vasquez, established the fort on the Black's Fork of the Green River. The fort consisted of two simple double log houses about 40 feet in length, joined with a pen for horses. One pioneer summarized Fort Bridger by writing, quote, the buildings at Bridger are two or three miserable cabins, rudely constructed and bearing but a faint resemblance to habitable houses. The many immigrants who, for weeks, looked forward to their arrival at Fort Bridger were, like this sighted pioneer, frequently disappointed by the fort and what it had to offer. The first Mormon pioneer company arrived at Fort Bridger on July 7, 1847. This company spent a day at the fort, but like other pioneer parties that came before them, found Fort Bridger's prices unreasonably high and they quickly left the area. In 1850, however, the Utah territorial government made the region around Fort Bridger a county, and soon thereafter, a camp of Mormon pioneers settled nearby Fort Bridger. Predictably, friction arose between Bridger and these new settlers. Brigham Young responded to this friction by sending a Mormon militia to take control of both Fort Bridger and the neighboring Green River ferries, both of which became integral parts of the Mormon settlement plans for the region. When Mormon troops took over Fort Bridger, they built a large cobblestone wall around the compound, which is clearly visible in this historic photograph. The now Mormon-controlled Fort Bridger again became embroiled in controversy in the fall of 1857 when it became became a part of the Utah War of 1857 and 1858. As a reminder, the Utah War resulted from disagreements between Mormons and the federal government over questions of sovereignty, religious practice, particularly polygamy, land and water rights, and numerous other issues. The U.S. Army planned to use Fort Bridger as a base of operations for the march that they had planned to make into Utah, but members of a Mormon community burned the fort's buildings and supplies, forcing the U.S. Army to spend a miserable winter at the fort exposed to the cold with little shelter or food. Eventually, the Army rebuilt Fort Bridger as a base for troops assigned to protect railroad laborers, gold miners, and local Native tribes. The Army stayed on at Fort Bridger through the Indian Wars of the 1880s, but in 1890, with the end of these wars, the Army closed the fort, and many of its buildings were sold and dismantled later to be rebuilt as a Wyoming historic landmark in the 1930s. The second trapper outpost that had an outsized impact on Utah's history is, of course, that constructed by Miles Goodyear. Goodyear built and occupied Fort Buenaventura in what is now Ogden. Goodyear was born in Connecticut, but left for the American West when he was 19 and spent much of the subsequent decades trapping beaver throughout the Rocky Mountains. In 1845, with fur trades declining, Goodyear decided to build an enclosed fort on a large 
westward bend of the Weber River, approximately one quarter mile west of what is today the end of Ogden's 28th Street. Goodyear's fort comprised a palisade constructed with cottonwood logs set upright in the ground that then closed about one half acre of land adjacent to the river. Four log cabins occupied the corners of the fort and sheds, corrals, and a garden were also located within this enclosure. Additional corrals for other animals were located on the outside of the Palisade Wall. In November 1847, the Mormon leader James Brown purchased Fort Buenaventura and Goodyear moved to California. From this point forward, Goodyear's Fort was rechristened as Brown's Fort, Brown Settlement, and subsequently Brownsville. Of the original buildings at Goodyear's Fort Buenaventura, only one of the cabins has survived to the present day, and this cabin can be regarded as Utah's oldest Anglo-American structure. Little remains from the Mountain Man era of Utah's history save the occasional historic site marked with a plaque, or in the case of the Goodyear cabin, this simple structure. But the mountain men and the forts and posts they constructed were transitional elements in a much larger narrative. In our next lecture, we will discuss the subsequent chapter of Utah's architectural development by remarking on the arrival of the pioneers in 1847. As always, we greatly appreciate the support of our constituents, our members in particular, and our sponsors. We encourage all of you to donate to preservationutah.org to help us sustain our operations and produce this sort of programming and other types of programming, and of course, support the advocacy that we do on behalf of Utah's historic built environment. We appreciate your support greatly. Thank you.